How can we calculate the distance from a lightning strike? When lightning strikes, we first see a flash and then hear a clap of thunder. Since light is much faster than sound, we can ignore the time it takes the light to reach us. So the lightning flash indicates when the sound waves begin to travel from the source. All we need to do is to count the seconds as soon as we see the flash until we hear the thunderclap. We know what the speed of sound is, so we just need the time to be able to calculate the distance. When we finish counting the seconds, we multiply the number of seconds by the speed of sound to find the approximate distance. Is zero an even or an odd number? Zero is an even number. Why is infinity minus infinity not equal to zero, and infinity over infinity not equal to one? This is because we can't treat infinity as an ordinary number, and we can't say that two infinities are the same. Maybe the first infinities represent nine times nine times nine and so on forever, and the second infinities represent one plus one plus one and so on forever and nine times nine times nine forever divided by one plus one plus one forever equal to one? We don't know, because the operations never end. Therefore, infinity divided by infinity and infinity minus infinity are undefined. Can you solve this question in one minute? Carl Gauss did when he was in primary school. Some researchers think Gauss simplified the series like this. If we sum the numbers vertically, we end up with the same result, 101. Since there are 50 sums, the result is 101 times 50 or 5050. Other researchers think that Gauss wrote another series under the first in reverse order and added the numbers vertically as before, giving the result 101. Since there are 100 sums, this makes 100 times 101, but because there are two series, Gauss divided the sum by 2 and found the result. Again, 5050. What is a perfect number in number theory? A perfect number is a whole number that's equal to the sum of all its factors except itself. For example, the number 6 can be divided by 1, 2 and 3 without a remainder. If we add these numbers we get 6, so 6 is a perfect number. The next few perfect numbers are 28, 496 and 8128. Nobody knows when or by whom they were discovered, but we know that many famous mathematicians such as Euclid, Alhazan, Euler, Mersenne and Descartes worked on the subject. Some people are under the impression that perfect numbers have mystical powers. For instance, they say God created the world in six days because six is a perfect number, or the lunar cycle is 28 days because 28 is a perfect number. The biggest unsolved question about perfect numbers is we don't know if there is an odd perfect number. What is the gambler's fallacy? Suppose we toss a coin a hundred times and get 85 heads and 15 tails. What's your guess for the next toss? Some people might say heads because 85 out of the last 100 tosses came up heads and so the chances are the run will continue. Others might say tails, in the belief that there must be more tails coming up to balance things out. Both guesses are based on a misconception known as the gambler's fallacy. In reality, there's always a 50% chance of getting heads or tails. These odds aren't affected by previous events. What is the Collatz conjecture? The so-called Collatz conjecture is an unsolved question in maths that's easy to explain. Choose any positive integer. If it's even, divide it by 2. If it's odd, multiply by 3 and add 1. 
Repeat this process with the result and just keep on going. Say we pick the number 5, it's odd. Therefore we multiply by 3 and add 1 which gives us 16. 16 is even so we divide it by 2 to get 8. Dividing by 2 again gives 4. Dividing by 2 again gives 2 and finally dividing this by 2 we end up with 1. 1 is odd so now we multiply by 3 and add 1 which gives 4. So we find ourselves in an infinite loop just repeating 4, 2, 1. The problem is, no one's been able to prove that the Colat's conjecture is true for all integers, and no one has found an integer that doesn't end in the 4, 2, 1 loop. What is the simplest way to prove Pythagoras' theorem? As you know, in a right-angled triangle, the square of the hypotenuse equals the sum of the squares of the other two sides. If we start with four identical right triangles and place them like this, we get a large square and a small square inside it. The area of the large square is four triangles area plus this small square's area. If we rearrange the triangles like this, we get a different shape without changing the area of the big square. Now the area of the big square equals the area of the four right triangles and the area of the small squares. We found two different formulas for the area of the big square. Putting these equal to each other, we find that c squared equals a squared plus b squared. How can graphs deceive us? There's a saying that numbers don't lie, but there are ways in which the story told by graphs can be deliberately manipulated without changing any of the numbers. Here's a magazine advertisement. At first glance, company A seems to have a significant advantage over the other companies. But if we look at the vertical axis, it starts not at zero, but at 95. That means the last 5% is magnified, making it appear that company A has a big advantage. If we start the graph at zero, we get a different picture. As you can see in reality, there's no significant advantage. Another way of using graphs to deceive is called cherry picking. For example, this graph shows the global surface temperature between 2003 and 2012. The graph makes it seem as if there isn't a significant global warming threat. But what we're being shown is just a small carefully selected part of a bigger graph. If we examine the bigger graph, the surface temperature is seen to have increased significantly. There are many ways to manipulate graphs without changing any numbers, so we need to be careful when examining them. What is Simpson's paradox? Let's look at an example in vaccine research. In the first study, vaccine A was tested on 40 people and found to be effective in 14 cases, giving a success rate of 35%. Vaccine B was tested on 60 people and found to be effective in 24 cases, giving a success rate of 40%. In the second study, vaccine A was tested on 60 people and was effective in 48 cases for a success rate of 80%. Vaccine B was tested on 40 people and was effective in 34 cases for a success rate of 85%. The individual results make it seem as if vaccine B was more effective than vaccine A. But if we look at the combined result, vaccine A was tested on 100 people and was effective in 62 cases, whereas vaccine B was tested on 100 people and found effective in 58 cases. Now, vaccine A is seen to be more effective than vaccine B. When ungrouped and grouped data produce opposite results like this, the situation is known as Simpson's paradox.